Let's uh, have a few moments of silent prayer, give you the opportunity to use 1 John 1, 9 if necessary, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity we have to study your word, to be refreshed by it, to have our attention focused on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and to understand his current position in the, his session in heaven and the significance of that session for us as church age believers in what you are doing in our lives and in the life of every believer during this church age in terms of your overall, uh, uh, your overall structure of history and where you are taking history. Now, Father, as we study uh, your word this evening, we pray that you challenge us with these things. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, I still didn't find my glasses after the other night. They have vaporized somehow. We have searched high and low, every nook and cranny in cars, house, parking lot here. So I'm back to using a cheap pair of reading glasses. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter... 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Now these first four verses have got to be one of the most significant passages and elevated terminology in all of the New Testament. The, the theology that is here, the doctrine that is here is, is just overwhelming. Every clause, every word is just loaded with, with meaning. And uh, it's sad as I reflected on this today and thought about some things that are going on in, in the world around us, in the world in which we all live, is that, that very few Christians and very few churches today really have take the time to, to comprehend all that's going on in these first four verses because it, it, to, to really appreciate it, you have to have just a, a huge frame of reference almost of, of doctrine to be able to appreciate the, the sublime message of this passage. And it starts off in Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God, and as we've seen before, I don't have the corrected translation up there, but that's actually how I'll, I'll read it. Uh, after God spoke in various forms in a variety of ways in time past to the fathers by means of the prophets. And that's the first verse. And the key idea here is that God spoke in the Old Testament. The main verb of the first two verses is found in the second verse that God has spoken. And this is crucial to understanding the, the fr whole framework of the, of the author of Hebrews as he begins, is that God has spoken. As we'll see in our exegesis of that uh, later on, this is what's called a culminative aorist, and it indicates a finality to the action that it's over with. God has completed his revelation. But unfortunately, down through church history, the church has failed to truly appreciate that. Even though they understood that the canon was closed, the canon actually was never officially closed by a church council until the Council of Trent, in the, which was a Catholic... Uh, anti-reformational council in the 16th century. They recognized certain books were canonical, but there never was a, quote, church council that went, this is it, uh, until you got to the uh, counter-reformation. And so down through church history, you've always had this, what, for lack of a better term, leakage of human viewpoint ideas into Christianity. And of course, the worst part of that took place in the period from about 600, I'll give you a little church history. You know, everybody needs a little church history every now and then, or a little history even. It gives us perspective on what's going on today because things just aren't, aren't, um, aren't new. I mean, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, and he said that 900 years before Christ. And so we've had another 3,000 years of nothing new under the sun. And we have to have an understanding of ideas. This was one of the things that I came to understand years ago in the study of the history of ideas because ideas 
don't just pop up. Now, you may think they do, and they may be new ideas to you, but these ideas that suddenly gain popularity today often are just wrapped in new guises, given new clothes, and they're not much different than something that was done uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 1,000 years ago. And by studying these other manifestations of these ideas gives us an understanding of of what is really involved because Satan in his, in his subtlety wraps these things up in very attractive garments so that these ideas seem to be very workable and seem very positive and, and they attract a lot of people. So it's important to understand something of the history of, of certain ideas and how they've had impacts uh, down, through, down through the generation. Well, in the, in the early church, from about 500 or 600 A.D. down to the Reformation, which began in 1517, you had the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church merged the Bible with church tradition so that in Roman Catholic theology, the Bible is a living document. Almost sounds so contemporary, doesn't it, with regard to the Constitution? It's always changing. And you, you add to it from generation to generation with all the interpretations of the popes and the theologians of the church and everything. So there's this, if you represented it this way with a set body of, of divine viewpoint truth, there's always this assault from Satan with ideas that come from outside and the tendency of, of church, not just Roman Catholicism, but the tendency of almost every theological tradition down through church history has been eventually to lose their integrity of scripture and to begin to assimilate biblical truth with cultural ideas. And what happens is this is how Satan dilutes and perverts the truth of scripture so people give up the sufficiency of the faith and they begin to hear these other phrases and ideas and they sound good and they become very popular and they sound very workable and in many cases they represent the heartbeat of a culture but they're they're not biblical even though they may get wrapped in biblical terminology and in American history because our background is so so rooted and grounded in, in Puritan theology and in Christianity that everybody wants to claim God and claim the Bible and quote Bible verses to support their position to give it legitimacy. I mean, we've got politicians from the extreme left all of a sudden after the last election popping up and quoting all kinds of Bible verses in context and out of context and you just wonder when it was that they ever picked up a Bible. But it makes them popular and they're trying to uh, make themselves sound like they're, they're in line with, with American tradition. So you always have this kind of leakage going on. And the reason it's important to understand this is, as believers is we all deal with this at different levels in our own life. Uh, even if you've been a, a believer for a long time, you've taken in the word, you have to deal with it in terms of your family. You often have to deal with it in terms of friends that you have. You often have to face this in terms of of co-workers and people ask you questions and so it's important to kind of often when you have to interact with unbelievers or with believers who are caught up in fuzzy or not really solidly biblical uh, Christian traditions you have to have a framework for example if um, now's a good time to talk about this if you are trying to witness to a Roman Catholic you have to make sure they understand the phrase faith alone in Christ alone. And I'm going to put this last alone in uppercase. That's the real issue because they have, if they've really understood what is taught in Roman Catholicism, they don't really, it's very hard for them to, to understand this that they're not doing this last concept when they really are. And I, I say that with experience years ago, 20 years ago or so, when I was working on my second master's at the University of St. Thomas here, which of course is a, we had a Dominican faculty in the uh, philosophy department, and there were three or four 
uh, well-trained, well-educated uh, priests that uh, were there. Well, it's not Dominican. It's another order. I forget now. But they were uh, very well-trained. And there were two of us in the program that were Dallas Seminary THMs. And we used to have some very engaging conversations with the Catholic priests trying to get them to understand justification by faith alone. And when you're talking to someone who's from a Roman Catholic background, they're taught to trust the church and to trust the sacraments and to trust in uh, various works because it's an ongoing process and to trust in Christ. So you can see Christ is not alone. But to get them to understand that sometimes takes a lot of work because you can ask them, are you believing that Christ is the one who gets you into heaven? Oh, yeah. But see, what, what they've been indoctrinated with is it's Christ plus something else. So if you're witnessing to a, someone from a Roman Catholic background, you have to take some time on this issue. It may bother you. You may have trouble with it. But they have to understand that because if you just say you need to trust Christ to be saved, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? Yes, they do. Do you believe Jesus Christ alone is the only thing that saves you? That if you never participate in the sacraments, if you never go to church, if you never do good works, that you're saved. And it's just Christ alone. See, that's where the rubber meets the road. So we have to understand what's going on in the world around us, and that's just one example. Another example that, that I've said the last two or three weeks I would get to in terms of the impact of, of external revelation to uh, Christianity uh, is important in light of a couple of events that, that have come up lately. For example, there, a couple of weeks ago there was the uh, man in Atlanta, the uh, criminal who was up on... on uh, uh, rape charges, and he assaulted and killed the uh, deputy sheriff that uh, was uh, guarding him, and then he escaped. He killed several other people, he escaped, and he was holding a hostage of this young woman, and it made the news that she was reading Rick Warren's book, The Purpose, uh, or the, uh, the Purpose Driven Life, and he's made a just a, a, a name for himself because of this purpose-driven uh, mentality which has entered into Christianity. Rick Warren, most of you probably don't know who he is other than you've heard the book. He and a man named Bill Hybels who's up at a church called Willow Creek up in Chicago are the real fathers or gurus of the church growth, what is called the church growth movement. And the church growth movement has generated a number of of methodologies for building churches that have become very, very popular. One of those, we were just talking about it before class tonight, is called the Seeker Service. And this is where they, they take the Sunday morning service and they move it to a more of an evangelistically oriented service. And the idea there is you want to make it friendly, comfortable for unbelievers so that they can come and they're not challenged by doctrines like sin and judgment, anything like that. And all you... You do is teach really positive things, and you have a, a, a worship group up front where they're usually very contemporary music. You've got drums and guitars, and you've got uh, it's more entertainment than it is, is worship. And now, why do you need to know this? Because this, this just sweeps everywhere. You may be a little isolated, but uh, I'm familiar with the fact that there are three major, I just found out about one today, three major Bible churches in the Houston area. These are all churches that, that the youngest is 30 years old, and they've been around. One of them has been around since about World War I, and they're fairly large, and they've been strong centers of biblical teaching, but they, there's been such a change of pastoral leadership, a real changing of the guard among these groups in the last five years. They've all had pastors pastoral shifts. They've all had pastors who have been anchors at those churches for years and have stepped aside, and they've got newer people coming in and younger, younger men with these ideas, and they want to attract, they want to be evangelistic. Those are good motives. But what happens is they compromise on methodology, and as a result, all of these congregations are in turmoil. And usually it's the 55 and older crowd that is not too happy with these changes. And as, as my accountant told me the other day, he said, I don't want to sing a hymn that doesn't have a number on it. And uh, 
and it's not really an older, younger issue, although that's how it's pretty much displayed. But this pressure comes in how to grow a church, how to build a church, uh, uh, marketing and sales dominate. And you've seen the billboards and things like that. Well, where did this come from? It doesn't just pop out of nowhere. This, has, this is really rooted in trends that have gone on for uh, about 150 years. And it's kind of interesting to, to see where this, where this has come from. So if we look today, we've got th- three ideas I want to emphasize. One is um, uh, po- the power of positive thinking. You have the positive thinking movement. And, of course, everybody likes folks who are positive and never talk critically about things, and never, consequently you never learn how to think. The other uh, movement that comes along here was a term that was coined called possibility thinking. And then you have another movement called the positive confession movement. Now, most of you have been exposed to this or heard something about it over the years. Positive thinking movement was really put forth in a book called Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. That's really an older generation. I'm Peale, retired, I think, back in the 60s. But Peel said that the greatest, the greatest spiritual moment of his life occurred in a Shinto temple in Japan. Uh, so it just tells you everybody's going to save. All religions ultimately go the same way, and that was Peel's orientation. You can't ever say that somebody's wrong or that, that Jesus Christ is the exclusive way to heaven. Well, Peel's most famous disciple was a man by the name of Robert Schuller. And he's in the Crystal Cathedral, and a lot of folks know him. And I didn't know a whole lot about Robert Schuller until the early 1980s. I was pastoring a church down in Lamarck, Texas. And I got a book in the mail called Self-Image, The New Reformation by Robert Schuller. And he had mailed copies of this book to every pastor in America. Who knows what that, what that cost. But in there he said... The New Reformation, if we're going to change society like the Protestant Reformation did in the 15th century, we have to understand the issues are different. Now, it was okay to talk about sin and atonement and these kinds of negative things back in the 15th century because that's how they lived. But we don't need to talk about that today. That just offends people. See, what we need to make people understand is that Jesus died for their self-image. And Jesus died so you could have a positive self image. So we need to we need to build people up and we need to have just very positive messages that teach people how, how wonderful they are and and the the wonderful potential that God has given them and just always talk about how God loves you and never talk about sin. So you, you get the influence of the whole self image thing. And of course from from Peel, you get positive thinking, which is somehow the idea that if you think positively enough about certain things, you can channel energies, and that will create your own reality. That comes out of this. So all this stuff sort of merges. And that extreme is the positive confession movement, that if I just make a positive confession that something is true and I really believe it, that it'll come true, and that's faith in faith. If I just have the right kind of faith and faith, really believe it's strong enough, then it's going to happen. And this has really come down, and it is also known by a couple of other names called the Health and Wealth Gospel Movement or Prosperity Theology or two or three other names. Well, most of this is what you find on those Christian television shows that you don't watch. That's why you're not familiar with it. But these ideas, what happens is, and this, this is how Satan always changes a culture negatively. Remember that Satan is the architect of what the Bible calls the world system. And worldliness is simply made up of the ideas, the human viewpoint ideas that dominate in a culture. And these are the human viewpoint ideas that dominate in our culture. And as they seep into Christianity, 
what the, the flow structure is, they start off at one time and it's some, some obscure group or somebody has a revelation or some individual teaches uh, somebody or, or it's in, in, in the halls of academia and nobody hears about it. And it goes along for about a generation and then it begins to catch on and so the next generation of academics or leaders picks up on these ideas and begins to teach them as truth. And so now it's being taught at the seminary level or it's being taught at the undergraduate level by, by various professors. And then, of course, they've influenced all these pastors and all these people, and they go out and take the pulpits of the, of the nation, and then they begin to promulgate these ideas. And people hear them, and they sound good. They're not real discerning. And they say, oh, that sounds good. It, it, it has a certain amount of common sense to it. Satan's a master of cloaking things in, in terms and ways that sound very appealing to people. And they work. You know, Satan doesn't promote things that don't work because he wants success. He's the original uh, success man. So these ideas kind of float down. And we have Norman Vince Appeal and Shuler. And what's interesting is about... Uh, three days after that incident with the man out in, with the prisoner out in Atlanta, I was watching Larry King one night, and Larry King had Robert Schuler on. And Robert Schuler was talking about one of his favorite students, a man he had mentored for years. And the man he had mentored for years was Rick Warren. And this is played out in all of his, pos all of his books on the purpose-driven life. He, in the purpose-driven life, he has one statement about committing your life to Christ. That's as close as he gets to the gospel. But there's no mention of sin. There's no understanding of any of the dynamics of the spiritual life whatsoever. And what really got me a little disturbed about this was two weeks ago, I had lunch with a man who had grown up at one of the strongest doctrinal churches in this area, and his father had been, and his parents had been in that church for over 45 years, and they gave him a copy of this book, thinking how wonderful it was. And none of these people should have ever even gone close to this, this book. Now, the son was very disturbed about it because uh, he had been listening to my tapes for a while, so he, uh, he realized what a problem was, but but his, his father didn't. We have to teach discernment. I learned this after, after Robert Schuller sent his book out. I made some comments without mentioning his name because Lord knows you're going to get in trouble. You'll mention somebody's name. Somebody's going to say you're judging him. No, you're just teaching people how to evaluate thoughts. And I, could do, I would draw the picture without mentioning his name. And then some swan, sweet little old lady would come up and say, Well, you know, Pastor, we just wish you'd be a little bit more like Robert Schuller. And they just never had any idea who I was talking about. So if you don't name the guy, people, the sheep are dumb. They can't connect the dots. If I don't connect them for you, you'll never connect them. So you got to name names. Now there's another fellow who's operational over here at Lakewood. And he also claims that Robert Schuler mentored him. And Schuler mentored his father as well. But where did these ideas come from? And I want to get into Hebrews and some good stuff, so I'm just going to wrap it up, up here in a minute. Back in the, around 1850, there was a guy named Phineas Quimby, Phineas Parker Quimby. And Phineas Quimby had a very famous disciple by the name of Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddy. And she founded the Christian Science Movement. This was the idea that... that, that Bad health or sickness isn't real. It's just all in your mind. And all you have to do is just believe that you're well and you will be. See how that, the similarity of that to, to possibility thinking, positive thinking, and positive confession. And her, I, those ideas impacted her, but they didn't come from her. They came from another guy by the name of E.W. Kenyon. And none of you ever heard of E.W. Kenyon, I'm sure. Every now and then when I teach this, somebody says, oh, yeah, I remember reading his books years ago when I first got saved. E.W. Kenyon flourished in the early part of the 20th century, and he wrote a whole bunch of books, and he had a very popular ministry in charismatic churches. And so his positive, uh, positive thinking techniques that came from Phineas Parker Quimby and his uh, uh, school of metaphysics in Boston uh, came into Christianity. E.W. Kenyon rejected Christian science because he said there wasn't, quote, there wasn't, quote, enough of the blood of Christ, unquote, in Christian science. 
What do you mean by that? It, it didn't have enough Christian terminology. It didn't use enough Bible verses. And so what he did was he basically took Christian science teaching and he tacked all these Bible verses onto it and cloaked it in a lot more biblical sounding terminology and created this whole system. And then that, his works were plagiarized by a guy by the name of Kenneth Hagin. Now, some of you have heard of him, Kenneth Hagin Sr., out of Tulsa, and he influenced Oral Roberts, and he influenced all the major Pentecostal thinkers, and it's been demonstrated conclusively that he plagiarized from E.W. Kenyon. In fact, back when I was working on, see, I know all this stuff because I did Ph.D. work on this, and, uh, and it's just, I don't want you to go read on this stuff because it just, it's just disturbing, but you, you, as a congregation, as people, you need to have kind of an idea, a sense of where these things come from. And see, what's happening is they're borrowing ideas from outside of Scripture and cloaking them in biblical terminology and then inserting them into the Scripture as part of how to interpret and understand the text and how to understand Christian life. And there have been a number of doctoral dissertations. And, in fact, there was one, a master's thesis written by a man named McConnell at uh, Oral Roberts University that demonstrated conclusively by showing page, comparing pages from Kenyon on one page and, and Hagen on the other, that he basically plagiarized 80% of his uh, books from uh, E.W. Kenyon. And so all these ideas of human potential, denial of sin is a basic problem in man, basic belief that man can become, in some cases they talk about him being like a little god, you can control your life, control your destiny, all entered in through these major major movements and those major movements have impacted the church growth movement they've impacted people like Rick Warren they've impacted people like Joel Osteen and this is the framework they're coming from this is why when you pick up their books you won't hear read any mention of sin in fact the other man I mentioned earlier Bill Hybels who started helped one of the gurus in the church growth movement when he first started Willow Creek Church which was up until a couple of years ago the largest church in America started it from just a, a handful of people uh, after he got a two or three hundred people he decided to teach them a little bit about the Bible and so he wanted to teach them on sin and within three weeks he lost 80 percent of his congregation so his uh, uh, deacons came to him and said you got to quit teaching about sin and it just scares people off and so he did and everybody came back but this is what happens when you don't believe in clearly in the cessation of revelation. And it's not just a matter of sitting out there as you do and say, well, I believe that, that revelation ceased and we're not going to import ideas. But it's, it's putting that into real practice in the seminaries and Bible colleges because, I mean, these ideas just seep in. We just haven't created leak-proof institutions that can, are waterproof institutions that can keep this out. And what happens today is that people are more interested in coming to a church be, that, that operates on this mentality, because this is just worldliness, folks. It's just, it, it, it just the message of the world uh, of self-help and, and human potential stuff that's just the same as you get from any other motivational speaker, and it just has a few Bible verses and biblical terminology tacked onto it so that it sounds good and it assuages their, their uh, guilt complex about, about what they're doing and they feel like it's biblical. And uh, we'll feel that pressure as, as a local church. And I used to warn the folks in Preston City about this because this is where next gen so many of the next generation younger men have been influenced by this kind of thinking. And today I had lunch with a man that's been a pastor in the Houston area for many years, PhD from Dallas Seminary, and it says, has a solid teaching church up in the Woodlands area. And he said since there have been two or three of these secret churches that have come into the Woodlands in the last couple of years. And he said that, that in the last four or five years, they have steadily seen a, a decline in their attendance. Why? People would rather go someplace and sit and be told how great they are, how much God loves you, and all you can do in your life. And there's no problem you can. And that's, that's true if you've got it handled right. But there's no scripture that's ever taught people don't ever open their Bibles. They have all this entertainment, and they would rather have that than learn how to think, learn how to take notes, learn how to read their Bible, realize that they're a sinner and that God uh, has a gracious plan of salvation and a gracious plan of recovery. But the goal is, is growth. Jesus Christ is taking you someplace to prepare you 
for ruling and reigning with him. And that's where we come in the next verse. And let me tell you, I don't know how anybody could even teach Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 in the shallow mentality that's around today. This is such rich, rich language to telling us all about what God is doing in these days. Hebrews 1, 2 uh, begins, has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. Now we need to correct the translation on this a little bit so let's go through some exegesis. First of all we have the phrase in these last days. Now that tells us that the church age is understood overall as a period called the last days. Uh, The Jews had a threefold understanding of history. And this term, the the last days, referred to the third or the final age in uh, God's uh, outworking of history. It wasn't a, it was a rudimentary sort of um, uh, rudimentary dispensational view. And so the term the last days includes the church age as well as the tribulation. It's everything between the cross and the realization of the kingdom of Christ when he establishes it at the second coming. So there's a contrast between how God revealed himself in a variety of forms, in a variety of ways to, uh, to the fathers by means of the prophets in, in, in former days. And in these last days, it's come by his son. It's not ongoing. So the time frame in, par- in parallel to the uh, previous verse, which was in former times, it, we're now talking about in these times. The main verb, which is the main verb for the whole sentence, which runs from 1-1 one, one to 1-4, one, is the verb has spoken. God is the subject. God has spoken. And the verb here is uh, elelethen, which is the aorist, aorist active indicative form of the verb laleo, which simply means to speak. And it usually has to do with an overt speaking, a vocalization, not just something that's thought, but an overt speaking. And that God has spoken. The aorist tense here is a consummative aorist, which refers to a finished act. It refers to a finished act. The uh, consummative aorist looks at an event in the past as being completed. So the idea of Uh, God speaking through his son is viewed as a completed and finished act. And of course, it is being finished by the apostles because the son never wrote anything down. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, he never wrote down. He didn't keep a diary. He didn't write things down. He didn't even have his disciples write things down as he taught them. He didn't have somebody uh, recording his messages or transcribing them or taking dictation This was all handled through the doctrine of inspiration of Scripture as God the Holy Spirit uh, wrote through them uh, after the Son had ascended to heaven. So God has spoken in these last days to us. I don't have that highlighted, but it's to us, that is to church-age believers by means of his Son. And you should not have his there. That is added. In in some of your Bibles, it'll be in italics, which means it's not in the original. Just draw a line through it. It is by son. And there's no article with the noun. The noun is huio. In huio. And it has uh, the preposition in plus the dative, which indicates instrumental uh, means. And it's by means of son. And there's no uh, article associated with the noun, which indicates the writer is emphasizing quality, the quality of the noun, the superiority of Jesus Christ. In contrast to the previous verse, which said that he spoke by me, in, the, in former times by means of the prophets, and it's in tois prophetes, the tois being the uh, definite article. So without the article, it emphasizes the quality of the Son. He gave it by the Son. So we have to understand something about who the Son is. 
And this introduces us to the doctrine of the sonships of Jesus Christ. And there are six sonships of Jesus Christ. So point number one, just to simply identify what I just said, there are six sonships of Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Point number two, one of these sonships describes Jesus' undiminished deity. The other five sonships emphasize different aspects of his humanity. So point number one, there's six sonships. Point number two, one emphasizes his undiminished deity. The other five emphasize different aspects of his humanity. Point number three, the first title we'll mention is the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham. Jesus is called the son of Abraham in Matthew 1, 1. And here the emphasis is on his Jewishness. As the son of Abraham, he is identified as a Jew. It is, he's identified as a descendant in, through the genealogy there of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, making him a Jew. But he is called the son of Abraham. And it means uh, two things. It, it not only emphasizes his Jewishness, but it also relates him to the Abrahamic covenant. It also relates him to the Abrahamic covenant, and we'll see that he, according to Paul in Galatians, he is the seed identified in the covenant. So son of Abraham identifies him as a Jew and relates him to the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Point number four. Point number four, the second title, is that he is called the son of David. The son of David indicates his royal lineage, because he can trace it back to David, who was the greatest king that Israel ever had. But it also, just like the former title, tied him into the Abrahamic covenant. It connects him to the Davidic covenant. So the title, uh, Son of David, emphasizes his royalty and his royal relationship to to, uh, David. And then second, to the Davidic covenant. And that is also a fulfillment of prophecy. See, the writer's connecting these things very, very subtly because in both Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, behold, a son is given. That idea, a son, is a messianic Davidic term. That's what we're seeing in Hebrews, actually in Hebrews 1, is this term term that, that, um, that by his son, if you're a Jew, you're thinking in terms of Davidic sonship and messiahship. That's just a loaded term. And Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6 are, also, are two passages. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6 are two passages that emphasize the Messiah's sonship with David. The third title is the son of Adam. The son of Adam. And that's found in Luke 3, 38. Son of Adam in Luke 3, 38. And that is, again, in Luke's genealogy, which traces Jesus all the way back to, to Adam. And that is to emphasize his genuine humanity. His genuine humanity. So son of Abraham indicates his Jewishness and his relationship to the Abrahamic covenant. Son of David indicates his, his royalty and his relationship to the Davidic covenant. Son of Adam indicates his humanity and his uh, true humanity, genuine humanity. And it is the background for his being able to bear our sins because he is united with us, according to Romans five twelve to 21. Fourth, or the sixth point, see, point number three was the first title, point number four was the second title, point number five was the third title, point number six, the fourth title. He's the Son of Man. The term Son of Man indicates his humanity. It indicates his humanity. In Hebrew idiom, if you wanted to describe somebody's character, if they were a miser, you'd say they were a son of a miser. If they were a happy person, they would say they were the son of happiness. If they were an encourager, You would say they were the son of encourager. We have somebody like that, Barnabas. He was a son of encouragement. And so you would use an attribute and attach son of to it in order to, to ascribe that attribute to somebody. So when you read the title son of man, what it's being emphasized is humanity. In the Old Testament, there are numerous examples of people being called, uh, if they were a murderer, they were called a son of a murderer. If they were a fool, they were called the son of a fool. If they were particularly heinous, they were called an SOB. Now, that's a son of Belial in the, in the Old Testament. And that was how these um, 
attributes were made. So when you read the title Son of Man, it's not talking about derivation in terms of being born. It's talking about humanity, that a person is characterized by true, true humanity. And that's how the title is used of Jesus in Mark chapter 2, verses 27 to 28, and John 5, 27, uh, 629, and 662. Son of Man stresses his human nature. It also emphasizes his suffering. The term Son of Man is often used in relationship to his physical uh, suffering and it, that he endured the physical punishment that he endured in his humanity. A third way the title is used, son of, that the title Son of Man is used, is unique to the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, he's emphasizing uh, an, uh, an element that comes out of Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, in the vision that, that Daniel sees of, of all the kingdoms of man that are pictured as beasts, there is the Son of Man who comes and destroys the kingdom of man when he returns at the second coming. So it's a picture of this, this supra-historical figure coming out of heaven who destroys the, the, the mass of human kingdoms that are arrayed against God. That's the thrust of Daniel chapter 7. So when John uses that term, son of man, it's just loaded with this prophetic significance that this is the one who's coming to destroy the, the kingdoms of man. So that is... Uh, uh, that, that emphasizes Jesus in his, in his pre-existence as well. So, Son of Man has various nuances, his, stressing his human nature or the suffering he endured in his human body, or it has this prophetic or eschatological significance. Then, the seventh point, which is the fifth title, is called the Son of Mary. And this is in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And this emphasizes, again, the humanity and the birth of the Savior through the virgin conception and birth through Mary. Again, it emphasizes his genuine humanity. Jesus is not, I mean, Mary is not the mother of God. This was a term that was introduced in the third century uh, A.D. and became an issue in some of the church councils in the uh, fifth century after the Council of Nicaea. And it was a battle over whether he was to be called the mother of God or the mother of Christ. And technically, she should be called the mother of the humanity of Christ. She is not the mother of God, which has unfortunately been accepted by a, a certain uh, ecclesiastical groups. So the seventh point is the fifth title, Son of Mary. And then the eighth point is the sixth title. All the previous ones, son of, David, uh, son of Abraham, son of David, son of Adam, son of man, son of Mary, all emphasize different elements of his humanity. But son of God emphasizes his deity. See, it's what's after that son of? It's God. It's saying that he is God. It's not talking about the fact that he was born or that he had a beginning. It is indicating that he is full, total deity. And this is very important for understanding uh, some of the things we'll get into in Hebrews 1, and especially as we go over to Psalm 2 to uh, fill in the background for what's going on here. He is called the Son of God. This is found in a number of passages, including Luke chapter 3, uh, verse 38. He is fully God. It emphasizes that Jesus is one of the persons of the Trinity and that he is undiminished deity. So all of these points emphasize these six different sonships. So when we come to a passage like Hebrews 1-2, we have to say which sonship is in view here. Which sonship is in view here? And what we're seeing is that this is the, a messianic concept emphasizing his relationship. Remember, he's writing Jews, and he's talking about the fulfillment of the Son in light of these Old Testament references, uh, the, the declaration of the Son in Psalm 2-7, which is the first verse that's quoted in Hebrews 1-5. So we'll get into that. But it is just tremendous to see how all this begins to tie 
together and lay a foundation for what Jesus Christ is doing in the church today. So the writer says, in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. And the very uh, use of this word without an article indicates the quality of the son or the superiority of the son. And then there are a series of relative clauses that follow this telling us something about the son, why the son is so significant, why it is that, that everything preceding the son is viewed as a lesser category, but once the son arrives on the scene, what is revealed through him surpasses and supersedes everything and is an, therefore an ending to revelation. The first phrase is whom he has appointed heir of all things. Whom he has appointed heir of all things. And the verb there, appointed or has appointed, is the aorist active indicative of the Greek verb tithemi. The Greek verb tithemi means to set or to place, to assign a place, to establish, or to appoint to a position. And so this is a technical term that God the Father, who's the subject of this verb, it's a third person singular verb, God the Father is the subject of the verb, he appoints the Son to a particular position, demonstrating the authority of the Father over the Son. Now why is that important? It is important because if we're going to understand authority relationships, and if you're going to understand uh, freedom and authority, then you have to understand the Trinity. The Trinity is not just this abstract doctrine that, yeah, we believe in, in a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's what the Bible teaches, but it, it, it represents ultimate reality that when you go back beyond creation, when you go back beyond the angels, when you go back beyond everything, what you have that existed for eternity was a triune God of three distinct persons with one essence, and they are all eternal, they are equal in their essence so that the Father is not superior to the Son. The Son is not inferior to the Father. The Holy Spirit is not inferior to the others. They are equal in their essence. They are equal in their very person and being, but yet there is an authority structure. Now, what does that mean? That means that authority structures don't say anything about the quality or essence of a person. That means you can work for some boss who's just a loser, and it doesn't mean he's any better or worse than you. That means you can be in the military, and you can be under an NCO or under an officer who is not very qualified for his position, and that doesn't mean he's a better person than you are. It means that you can be in a marriage as a woman, and you can be smarter, brighter, uh, sharper, more positive spiritually than your husband, and it doesn't mean you're better than him or he's better than you because he's the one God put in authority. And that's what we don't understand in this country. We want to make the person in authority as better than the other person. And this failure to understand this is at the very core of the whole feminist movement. It's at the very core of what we're seeing today with the rise of women who want to be pastors. And in many denominations, this is just... It, it, it is a rant, it's an epidemic of women going into the pulpit. And once you do this, it subverts and reverses the whole authority structure within society, and it lays the groundwork for just an eternal collapse, an eternal rot, because families fall apart, uh, marriages fall apart, churches fall apart, because you subvert the basic authority structure God designed. And what you've heard from the uh, radical feminist movement since the 1960s is that, that uh, we're, if you're equal, you can't be under the authority of someone. And you ought to, if you're equal, you ought to be able to do everything that the other person, so your parts are interchangeable. Well, if your parts are interchangeable, then ultimately that means that it doesn't matter whether the other part is a male or a female, and you end up with same-sex unions. And you don't have a basis for, you, if you're a radical feminist, you have to support same-sex unions. Otherwise, you're completely inconsistent, because you're saying that everything's equal, and so then everything is interchangeable, and it doesn't matter whether it's two men, two women, a man and a woman, or whatever, they're, they're all equal. So... All this goes back to understanding the Trinity. And not only does it affect that, it affects how you understand uh, so social structures. Because only on the basis of a 
Trinitarian God can you have total equality of the parts and where the whole also has significance and importance. And in a nation, you have the, the importance of the whole as the nation as a whole. Uh, and usually what you have, you go to one extreme, you have a totalitarian government where the whole or the one is more important than the parts. Or if you go to some sort of anarchic uh, libertarian view, what do you have? You have all the different parts are just uh, are, are more important than the whole, and you end up in anarchy and fragmentation. And those are the two extremes. But the Trinitarian concept says you can hold both at the same time where you can give real value to the significance of each individual part, that is, each individual citizen, without the state absorbing and taking over uh, power and authority from the parts. And on the other hand, the parts can give real authority to a, a centralized government. And the Founding Fathers understood these distinctions, they, whether they, they were fully self-conscious of everything. Some were. You go back and read the writings of the Puritans on government, and they just had some fantastic insights, but it comes out of their understanding of, of the Trinity. So we see at this, at this juncture an introduction to the, to the role of the Son within the framework of the Trinity, that the Father's in authority, and he appoints the Son to be the heir of all things. I mean, did I skip a, skip a phrase? Okay, I don't have it written down there. He's the heir of all things, and that's the word kleronomos, and I'm going to come back and we're going to do, do, do a whole study on this, because this is the core idea, is the inheritance of the Son. But the concept of inheritance in the Scripture, going back to the Old Testament, is the idea of possession and ownership. And what happens here is God says that at one point in time, He appoints Jesus Christ as the owner, the possessor. He's got the title deed to the universe. This is a man who has the title deed. He is appointed to be the possessor. He doesn't have it yet. He has just been designated as the heir, the owner of all the universe. That is not activated until he establishes his kingdom at the second coming. And this is foundational to understanding what is going on with the church in the church age because we are being prepared. Not only are we co-heirs, not only are we heirs with God at the instant of salvation, but if we advance in the spiritual life so that we are the Nike believers of, of Revelation 2 and 3, the overcomers, if we are the, uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews uses the term part, uh, partakers or sharers with Christ, and the Greek word is metakoi, if we are metakoi Nike believers, then we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And we will rule and reign with him as priests and kings uh, to God in the millennial kingdom. And so all of that is embedded in this one phrase, that God has appointed the Son as the heir of all things. And it is through the Son that he made the worlds. And it's not just worlds. It is the Greek word, ionos, ages. So it emphasizes that it's through the Son, dia plus the genitive, indicating intermediate agency. That God the Father used the Son as the intermediate agent, and it was the Son who constructs history. Because the word that is translated worlds is the Greek word, ionos, and it's in a plural form, so it means ages, not worlds. Uh, I got that somehow messed up, but... That's what that middle line is that just appeared. Ionos, ages of history. So what this is saying is that God has spoken to us by his son, and his son is the one, th first of all, through uh, who's, he, he's appointed heir of all things, and secondly, the one through whom he constructed history. He laid out the ages, laid out the dispensations. And so we have to wrap it up now, but next time we'll come back. We'll start there with how he constructed the ages and how all of this is working together. This is a magnificent plan that God has constructed that, that with, with the absolute chaos that entered the universe, when sin entered the universe, it, it's just like a massive fragmentation 
that took place. It's like, like Adam just set off a, a frag grenade that, that, that just disrupted and distorted everything in the universe, not just what was on planet Earth. But planet Earth is the centerpiece, the center point. And what happens when Jesus Christ comes and pays the price for sin on the cross, this be, lays the foundation for pulling everything back together. And it is when he is elevated to the right hand of God the Father at the ascension that he is decreed to be the Son. And at that decree, he is given, I'm just giving you an overview here, he is given the title deed to the earth. This is a decree that is made. And you say, well, well what, how do we know this? Well, if you jump ahead to what we're going to see when we get to Revelation 4 and 5, we're going to see that there's this scene in heaven. And John goes up to heaven, and there's this scene where they have a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. And they're walking, and the angels are up there saying, who's worthy to open the scroll? Well, what's the scroll? The scroll is the title deed to the earth. And who's, op- who's worthy to open this scroll? And it's the Lord Jesus Christ who was, who was slain. He, and because of that, he's worthy to take that title deed and to activate it. And he opens the seals. And that's what brings all those judgments that culminate in the second coming. And then he returns to the second coming and takes title to the kingdom of earth and establishes that and reverberates throughout all the universe. And it is the final uh, pulling together, pulling back together of everything that fell apart when Adam sinned. I mean, it's just, it, it is a magnificent plan. But so few people understand this. And, and we, we have to understand the priesthood of Christ. We have to understand uh, the, whole, the doctrines of ascension and session and, and the r- role with the angels, everything. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is, is dealing with in this whole book. So that just gives you a little taste of what's coming, but it, it's fun. There's just such great stuff here that people very rarely get to talk about. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word this evening. We thank you for all these magnificent things that you've revealed to us, and ultimately let us not forget that it's designed to, to challenge us, to stretch us, and to uh, uh, point us in the direction of where you're taking us as those who will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. We just uh, pray that you would uh, guide and direct us as we think about these things and the Holy Spirit would make these things real to us. We pray in Christ's name, amen.